What's up, Navigating Academia family? This is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh here to be able to answer a valued viewer's question. Love you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please make sure to smash that like button to be able to make sure that we get as many views as possible on this video. Help to grow the channel. Help to get more subscribers. You guys know me. My goal is just to help as many people as possible. You can help me out a ton by taking the URL to this video. Just post it to your social media. Post on your Twitter. Post on your Facebook. Whatever you got would mean a lot to me. So I really appreciate it. So let's go ahead and get on to the question from today. The question is from Hannah. So Hannah, thank you so much. You've had several very nice comments recently. So just know, Hannah, that I really appreciate you. I appreciate you watching. Being here on the journey and the fact that you care so much that you're watching the videos means a lot, not only to me, but also to the individuals who are going to benefit from your knowledge down the line. It's a great thing. So let's go ahead and read Hannah's question. Hannah's question was left on a video that I made called How to Find an Academic Mentor. Okay, so here's Hannah's question. Hi, Dr. Singh. Thanks for your videos. As always, I had a partly related question. I'm a sophomore studying education and psychology, specifically language development and education. I'm always so encouraged by your videos when you say that you're never too young to start publishing, which is true. Uh, the problem is that all the professors I've approached have discouraged me from trying to obtain authorship as an undergraduate, saying that it rarely ever happens. Even the PI, which is the principal investigator, of the lab that I am a part of has told me that it would be better to start writing once I get to grad school and focus more on learning the content and getting used to the research process. I'm only collecting data at this point. How much truth is there to that? Are there still ways in which I could go about publishing as an undergraduate? Thank you again. Okay, Hannah, that's a great question. Uh, I, you know, this was something for me. I still remember uh, my undergraduate supervisor was this guy named Richard Lerner, who uh, I love to death and I think the absolute world of. And this is when I was in Boston. I was at Tufts University. And uh, I'll never remember, uh, sorry, I'll never forget Lerner sitting me down literally like the week before classes started freshman year and me telling him that my dream was to be a clinical child psychologist and him basically just saying, okay, if that's what you want, I'm going to tell you exactly what to do and then you got to do it and then uh, you'll have a shot. And so literally I ended up like planning on grad school and how to be able to get in and these things based on his invaluable guidance from literally before I even started undergraduate classes, right? And one of the things that he always impressed upon me and I never realized how important it was until the years went on was getting publications. And it, the, the PI is right that it is absurdly rare to be able to get publications as an undergraduate. But you need to understand that this is kind of a supply and demand thing because it's so rare to get the value that is placed on publications in the application process, especially when it comes to something like uh, clinical psychology PhD programs where at least in the United States, acceptance rates are lower than those in medical school. It becomes something that's a real differentiator because at the end of the day, it may sound really unfortunate, like it did for me, I promise you, but having amazing like 4.0 GPA, like perfect GPA, amazing, amazing, you know, top 25% GRE scores, you know, three phenomenal letters of recommendation, uh, having clinical experience of some sort and research experience of some sort. If you have all five of those things, you know, I remember when I was an undergrad, so many people who were seniors along with me, they basically said that they were going to like coast right into a clinical psych PhD program, uh, my cohort, because they were like, you know, why wouldn't we? We have all five of those things. And in my head, I kept scratching my head because I was like, you know, Lerner told me that that wasn't going to be the case. And sure enough, do you want to know how many of them got into a clinical psych PhD program? None. Zero did. It was me and one other person, and then one other person got into a PsyD program. That was it. Of all these people, though, who had told me, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a shoe-in, I got this thing, it's not a problem, none of them got in. And they were hyper, hyper competitive in terms of getting those five things. But as I've told you in my other videos, it's not sufficient. Now, if you don't have those five things, it's going to be a problem. Why? Because most people have those five things. But it's one of these things where if you really want to get in, publications and personal connections are really the way to go. I really believe that to be true. And becoming as much of an internal candidate as you can, I'll try to make another video on that later on in terms of the internal candidate thing, because people have been asking me for that, Hannah, so I'll, I'll try to do that. But the PI is right that it's exceptionally rare. But they're also right that it's something that you shouldn't kind of take on board the idea of writing a full-on publication yourself. The best thing to do is essentially to lend your time. As an undergraduate, you've worked your tail off. I have no doubt about it. But your skill set is basically nothing, 
right, compared to an advanced grad student, let alone a postdoc, let alone an assistant professor, let alone up the ladder, right? It's basically what you have to offer is, is time. And what I mean by that is that there's a lot of tasks that need to be done in a research process. So, for example, it could be, you know, data entry or, you know, basic statistical analyses, not, you know, HLM and propensity scoring, but like, you know, running, you know, tabular correlations and these things. Those are things that you can do. Those are things that are straightforward. There are things where it could be uh, conducting manipulations, like doing manipulations on stimuli, uh, the manipulation checks uh, before uh, an experiment is actually run. These are all things that you can do and they all take a lot of time, but the amount of skill that they take is not the amount of skill that it would take to be able to do something very, very advanced. And if you put all this time in, no, you're definitely not going to be the first author on a paper and you're not going to be the senior author and you're not going to be the corresponding author. And the likelihood is that you're not going to be the second author either, which is more the gopher position as we call it. You'll be somewhere in the middle, but you need to understand, Hannah, that when you're an undergraduate and you are trying to get publications, that's the kind of publication I'm talking about. For me, I uh, have a really weird background in story uh, in terms of like my personal life, but I ended up being the third author on a book, the third out of three authors on a book, like a book book, textbook, uh, when I was 20. It was before my 21st birthday. That had always been a dream of mine. And that does not happen to anyone. I'm the only one I've ever heard that happen to. That's not normal, so you shouldn't plan on that. And you don't need that to be able to get in. But I was also on a publication where I was 17th Hannah out of 18 authors. Why? Because all I did was, you know, hunt for research literature for the first author and the second author and the senior author. Uh, I would, you know, run stuff down if they needed me to go and get, you know, lab equipment and these sorts of things. I conducted statistical analyses. I created tables and figures for them. I did all this kind of stuff. And I did it in exchange for the publication. You don't need three publications, four publications. Frankly, if you have one publication and a, let's say something like a capstone project, senior honors thesis that you're planning on submitting, uh, you can literally just like take that thing, follow the instructions for authors for a low impact factor journal, write it, write up the manuscript in a compliant fashion, which will take a long time. I'll tell you right now and just submit that thing. You can do that and you'll be fine, right? Will it get published? Almost certainly not, I'm just saying, right? But it's more the idea that you tried. So you've got one thing or whatever that, you know, is being published. If you want to do that, like the 17th out of 18 authors thing, you should really start that in your junior year out of four years, right? Of uh, at least in the US system in college. So that's my recommendation there. It's going to take a while. Publications take at least a year, I would argue, uh, because of peer review process and these things. It can take a shorter time, but usually, you know, you should estimate a very, very minimum of eight to 12 months. So, and that's if it's a smooth peer review process. So that's the idea. In terms of what you can do to be able to get published, right? The most important thing Hannah to understand is that uh, this is a negotiating thing, right? Uh, whether or not you get on a paper or not is straight up negotiation. Before you start on the project, you need to negotiate and make sure that you're going to be on that paper. And that's the hardest thing, Hannah, because you're an undergraduate, you don't have a lot of power. There's like a power dynamic game. I mean, all of academia is just perceived power. Uh, most of academia is BS in that regard. Why? Because as an academic, you do most of your stuff for free and other people profit off of it. It's ridiculous, right? But like that's the game. So and some people are comfortable with that game. And so they play it. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, as long as everybody knows the score. But most people are lied to. And they think that, you know, if you're a professor, you make, you know, tons of money, which usually don't. Uh, and you have tons of opportunities for advancement, which usually you don't. And uh, these are just lies that people are told, which is why you watch the channel, Hannah, because I don't BS anybody, right? I just tell you literally what the truth is, right? Very transparently, because I have, I literally have nothing to gain by telling you any of this, and I have nothing to lose by telling you any of it. So there's no reason for me to lie. Um, so in any case, the best way to get publications, in my opinion, is uh, to work for free. And uh, yeah, if you're doing like research experience and these sorts of things, then that's going to be, you know, free anyway. You may even get like a college credit out of it or something like that. Make sure to look into that uh, if you haven't already for, uh, you know, the labs that you're involved in to be able to at least get some sort of course credit or get on your CV, even if it's just pass fail. 
Uh, but but that's a good thing. You know, you really need to be looking into this. Um, and it sounds like you are, which is great. But, you know, for me, what I did was that I did a summer internship. And I did a summer internship at the Yale Child Study Center, so in New Haven, Connecticut, which is where Yale's based. And uh, had a wonderful summer, an amazing time. And uh, when they said, you know, like, we don't really have that much money to pay you, I literally told my supervisor uh, for the summer, I said, I don't want to be paid. And they're like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, we have to pay you something. It's like, we can't pay you nothing. So what I told them was that I want a letter a recommendation. I want your personal connections with my doctoral, with my target doctoral supervisor to like call them up and tell them that if you don't take this guy, you know, like you're foolish, right? Which she phenomenally did. Uh, I need at least one publication and I need a conference poster, at least one, right? Now I didn't give a conference poster. I think I gave a conference paper, I'm pretty sure. But I went to, you know, national APA conference. Oh, no, no, it was a poster and I was able to co-present. No, it was a paper. I've only done one poster, so that can't have been it. Uh, so yeah, it must have been a paper presentation, but I sat in for somebody else. I wasn't the first author on it, but it didn't matter. It was the fact that I went and gave a conference presentation, right? So in any case, that's my recommendation, Hannah, is that I said, like, that's what I need. I don't need to be paid. The money isn't as valuable to me as this. Now, does that mean that I had to go into my savings a little bit and use some of the money that I already had from working odd jobs and these things to just, you know, pay the summer rent and, you know, buy ramen to be able to eat it and stuff? Yeah, I did. Right, but was it totally worth it? Absolutely, I got into my dream program. Right, I got into uh, both of my dream programs. There's one program which I really want to get into that I didn't get into, which was a bummer. But uh, one thing, Hannah, that's crazy to me is that you would be surprised how many people write me personal messages and emails, um, or even just post on the channel, and they say, uh, "Oh, you know, uh, most commonly, what the advice is out there is to apply to like you know at least 10 to 13 programs." And I'm like, "You are out of your mind." I would argue max, it should be like three or four, maybe one master's program, right? And why? Because if, if that's like, you know, the fail safe, you know, that's, you know, if you don't get in anywhere else or whatever, you get into a leading master's program, which would blow if you want to get into a doctoral program. But, you know, it is what it is. So it's one of these things. Why? Because you, I need you to spend an absurd amount of time establishing a goodness of fit with your target programs, getting to know your target supervisors. This is going to take a long time and I need you to do it. Uh, otherwise, you're not differentiating yourself. You know, so anyway, we're going to go all into this in other videos and all, but I just want to mention that because I think it's really important. So, okay, Hannah, thank you so much for your question again. Thank you to everybody for watching. I hope you have a great day. Peace and love, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.